Well, Thursday was my birthday, so thank you, thank you, thank you. One year closer to death. No, just get my dog. <laughs> so anyway, Julie and I went to New Orleans. We had a very special birthday dinner, and uh, we tried to come home to Luling. It was at a dead standstill. Had to go all the way around to the Huey Long Bridge, and so. We crossed the Huey Long, we're heading down 90 after a little while, and, uh, and it was about 11 o'clock at night, and all of a sudden, I saw in the headlights something in the, in, the, in the road, and I realized all of a sudden that it was a six-foot, huge alligator. And man, I tried to swerve the bam, bam, you know, the front tires, the back tires hit that thing, and we could just hear exploding alligator guts hitting the bottom of the, of the car, yeah, it was just terrible. And do you know that doggone gator destroyed the front bumper of my Camry? Less than a year old. Destroyed. Unbelievable. So next day, of course, I have to call the insurance, the car insurance people, and I get the insurance claims person on the phone. And I don't think he was really buying this alligator accident. Yeah, I think he kind of, oh, right, sure, a six-foot out, you know, right. Uh, but I, then he took some more information and says, well, where are you from? Well, I'm from Louisiana. Of course that's going to happen in Louisiana. Then he understood, okay. You see, there are things in Louisiana that we have to worry about that you just don't have to worry about in other parts of the country, like avoiding six-foot alligators in the middle of the night on the road. But worry is universal no matter where you are. It's just something that we, we do. And we talked about it last week, how, you know, we worry warts. We just find things to worry about. If there's not something to worry about, we'll, we'll make something up. But just listen to what this one woman wrote about her worry-filled day. I mean, it started from the moment she woke up to the, to the time that she put her head on the pillow and went to sleep. This is what she wrote. You wake up 10 minutes later than you had hoped, and anxiety already starts to creep in. What if I'm late? What if I'm late? What's the weather going to be like? You pass by the mirror and worry that your face has more wrinkles than it used to. You rush downstairs, and because you're in a hurry, you let the kids eat whatever they want, so then you start to worry if sugar really does cause cancer. And as you get the kids ready, you realize one of your boys didn't do his homework again. And you worry if he's ever going to get his head screwed on straight. And as you drop the kids off, you worry that they may fall into the wrong crowd or fall off the monkey bars. Once you get home, you pull up Facebook just to unwind. And there you read about how awesome everyone else's kids are and all the amazing cupcakes your friends make, and you worry that you might be a failure as a mom. Later in the morning, you feel that pain in your knee again, and you worry about having to get knee replacement surgery and whether your insurance will cover that and how you're going to pay for it and who will take care of the kids if you're laid up for a month. Then you worry that maybe the pain is something worse. So you check out all the medical websites and realize you probably have a rare case of whooping cough that has spread to your appendages. (laughs) Hours later, when the kids are in bed, you turn on the television to forget about the day. And as you flip through the channels and get caught up on the news, you start to worry about the economy and the hurricane season approaching and the rise of crime in your city. You worry about the racial division to this country. Maybe you worry about the safety of your brother who's a police officer. So you turn off the TV and talk to your husband and worry about his cough that doesn't seem to be getting any better and worry about the layoffs that they're having at work. (sighs) And finally, as you lay down for the night, you feel a tremendous sense of anxiety and you don't even know why. For reasons you can't even understand, you start worrying about life and kids and your parents and your church and your health and flying and driving and sleeping, eating, and a general fear that the days ahead could really be bad. I don't know what that was. Now I'm worried, okay? (laughs) I hope that wasn't my heart or anything. I don't know. But seriously, how's that for a day full of worry? I mean, anybody relate to some of that stuff, you know, whether you're a man or a woman, when we, we just do. Well, let me tell you, the people of Jesus' day, they had a lot to worry about, too. For one thing, 
Think about this. I mean, we think we've got it bad. Well, look, their country had been invaded by the most powerful army in the world, the army of the Roman Empire, just completely taken over, subjugated, and consequently, they were just taxed unbelievably by this ruthless and unjust government. There wasn't one thing they could do about it. They were helpless. That's something to worry about. And then they were being led uh, about, by the hypocritical, corrupt religious leaders who had sold out to Rome. And their land and their wealth was often confiscated, and their children were being influenced by this influx of Roman values and, and culture, and, and they were poor, and, and they felt abandoned by God. And they said, God, why don't you do something about these Romans? Get them out of here. And so Jesus addresses the worried people of his day, and he says in Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 to 34, well, instead of me reading it to you, why don't we watch it on the screen as someone else reads it to us? I'm sorry about that. I was just... Did you have the lights down a little bit? Did you know that God made us? Every boy and girl. I tell you not to worry about your life. Don't worry about having something to eat, or drink, or wear. Isn't life more important than food or clothing? Look at the birds in the sky. They don't plant or harvest. They don't even store grains in barns. Yet your Father in heaven takes care of them. Aren't you worth more than the birds? Can worry make you live longer? Did you know that God made the grass? Why worry about clothes? Look how the wild flowers grow. They don't work hard to make their clothes. But I tell you that Solomon, with all his wealth, wasn't as well clothed as one of them. God gives such beauty to everything that grows in the fields, even though it is here today and thrown into a fire tomorrow. He will surely do even more for you. Why do you have such little faith? Don't worry and ask yourselves, will we have anything to eat? Will we have anything to drink? Will we have anything to wear? Only people who don't know God are always worrying about such things. Your Father in heaven knows that you need all these. But more than anything else, put God's work first and do what he wants. Then the other things will be yours as well. Don't worry about tomorrow. It will take care of itself. You have enough to worry about today. And the guy did that all with his left hand. Can you believe it? It's unbelievable. So three times, three times in this passage that we just heard, you know, Jesus tells us to not worry. And he uses that same little word that Paul used in Philippians last week, merim nao, which means in this context to be full of anxiety, to be overly concerned and distressed about something. Now, again, it doesn't mean to not care about things or not be concerned about anything. It's not a call to be irresponsible in the way we, we live our lives, but it is talking about anxious worry that just overwhelms you, that preoccupies your mind and your heart, and that just robs you of your peace. So here in this passage, what we see is, is that Jesus gives us the key to being worry-free. And this key is something that just kind of unlocks the meaning of this whole passage that we've read. And, and in fact, just one word in verse 25, the very first word of, of verse 25 unlocks this passage, and it's the word, therefore. And if you've been around here for a while, you know that, you know, whenever we see therefore in a passage, we ask ourselves, what is it there for? You see, therefore always points back to the previous passage, to the context before, and, and, and it's always linked together like that. So what, what is Jesus talking about then right before the passage we just looked at? 
Well, it kind of goes back to verse 19 where he's talking about not storing up and hoarding treasures on earth. And Jesus warns, look, where your treasure is, that's where your heart's going to be also. What you really treasure, what you really valuable, your heart's going to be drawn to that. And then it talks about how nobody can serve two masters. You have to serve one or you have to serve the other. You can't serve them both. You have to choose to serve this one or serve that one. And then he kind of summarizes all that up and says in verse 24, right before verse 25, he says, you cannot serve both God and money. So Jesus is saying we can't serve both God and money. It is, and, and if God is the most important thing in the world to you, you're going to serve him. And if money is the most important thing in the world to you, you're going to serve it. But you can't do them both. You can't serve God and money both at the same time. Now, of course, there's nothing wrong with having money or making money. It's not a matter, uh, it's just, does, does money have you, not do you have money? It's not making sure that you're not a slave to money and let it rule your entire life. So, what does all this have to do then with worry? Here it is. Listen, if money is your master, you will worry, I promise you. You'll worry about losing it. You're going to be all anxious about making it. You're going to be worrying about, you know, oh, am I ever going to have enough? You'll be worried about it as you go to bed at night. You'll be preoccupied with you. Whoa, bing. Don't worry. I'm too worried. I got worked up about all this, okay? Please don't tell Julia I did that, okay? <laughs> she was here first service. She will die a thousand deaths. Connie, don't you do it. Don't, don't you do it. I'm counting on you. I'm trusting you. Okay. All right. If money is your master, you, it, it, it's going to take over your life. It's going to cause you to neglect your marriage. It's going to make you neglect your kids and your life and your ministry and your God. But if God is your master... If God is a master, of course you're going to be concerned about providing it for your family. That's something God wants us to do. But you won't worry. You won't be anxious. You won't be disraught nearly as much. You'll have a lot more peace. You'll have a lot more security. You're going to enjoy life much, much more. Obviously then, you know, so you, you tell me. Y'all have been listening. Let's see if y'all been listening. Do you think Jesus wants us to serve money? Or do you think he wants us to serve God? Hey, you were listening. Okay, serve God. That's what he's saying. Then verse 24, therefore, if you choose to serve God, if he is your real treasure, if he is really and truly the master that you are choosing to serve, then don't worry about your life, what you will eat or drink or about your body or what you will wear. So here's the big question we're going to ask this morning. How can we be worry free? Well, here's the key. How about those rhymes? How can we be worry-free? Here's the key. Okay, the key is this. Serve the right master. Serve the right master. This is, that it all kind of comes back to, this is kind of what, what kind of puts this whole passage together. Because, see, if you serve the right master, if God is the master we're serving, then we know that there's a lot more to life than just staying alive. Listen for a minute how the message uh, translation or paraphrase uh, paraphrases verse 25. Jesus says, if you decide for God, living a life of God worship, it follows that you don't fuss about what's on the table at mealtimes or whether the clothes in your closet are in fashion. There is far more to your life than the food you put in your stomach, more to your outer appearance than the clothes you hang on your body. So, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal serve, Savior, and if you are not serving him with your life, then you know what? Life is just, it's just all about you. It's about your accomplishments and your happiness and your possessions and your status in the world and your bank account and you, 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 you. And at the end of the day, guys, that's a pretty shallow, pretty selfish, pretty meaningless and insignificant life. But if you're a child of the king, 
If you are serving him, if, if Jesus is the master of your life, then your life has eternal significance. God is using you in this world to advance his kingdom on earth. And this, this is not all there is. This is just a little tiny preview of our entire eternal lives and a much better, more glorious life that we have awaiting us in heaven with him. That's if you're a child of the king, if you're serving him. So, serving the right master, boy, that's everything. And and serving the right master, we know that there's just a whole lot more to life than just feeding ourselves and avoiding death and staying alive. And we know, knowing that, it just helps us not to get so wrapped up and been out of shape and consumed with worrying about these kind of things in this world. And serving the right master, we also know that our master will provide for our needs. We've got a master. Okay, he's going to provide for our needs. We know he's going to provide the need to stay alive, okay? You know, the critical needs, the things that we just have to have in order to, to, to live. And Jesus is giving this sermon. I want you to kind of picture this. Um, should have brought a slide of it. But this, the Sermon on the Mount is, was, was taught just outside of Capernaum. Now, Capernaum is up there on the northern uh, side of the Sea of Galilee. And just outside of Capernaum, there's this beautiful hill that goes right into the Sea of Galilee. So you're sitting up there, you know, that's where Jesus was teaching. And you're looking out at the huge, beautiful Sea of Galilee. So that's, that's kind of the setting uh, that, that it is. And as Jesus was speaking, you know, preaching his Sermon on the Mount, and the, the, our passage is a part of that Sermon on the Mount, probably some, some birds just flew by as he was talking. And he said, well, look at the birds. Look, look at the birds up there in the air. They don't sow, they don't reap, they don't store away in barns, and yet your Heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they God takes care of birds. He he gives them food. He gives them the instincts to go and and have their young and build nests and all of that. It's all from God. Uh, But you, as a human being who is made in the image of God, who has a soul, you are a million, billion, quadrillion times more important than those birds. You know, God is merely the bird's creator, but he's your heavenly father. And he loves you, and he sent his son to die for you so that you could live with him forever. And so having that kind of relationship, the fact that he is our master, hey, he's going to take care of us. You know, he'll help us to make ends meet. He's going to put food on the table, and he's going to help us to pay the rent. He's going to help us to find that job. We don't need to worry with a master like that. Then verse 27, Jesus talks about the futility of work. So who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? You you know worry is just useless. We do it a lot, but it really doesn't do anything for us, but make us anxious, you know, and and it just doesn't accomplish anything. You've heard that statement, worry is like a rocking chair. It gives us something to do, but it doesn't get us anywhere, okay? That's what worry is. Let me ask you, let's think about it like this. Have you ever looked back in your life some really hard time, some tough thing that you went through and thought, man, I just don't know how I would ever have made it if I hadn't been eaten up by worry. Anybody ever done that? No, of course not. No, no. no. Nobody looks back and thinks, boy, money sure was tight, you know, when we first got married. But worry pulled us through. No, no, that's not. Junior high, boy, it was such a rough time. But worry got me through those difficult years. No, didn't have a thing to do with it. You'll never hear anybody say, you know, that diagnosis was frightening. But then I got all my friends to come over to my house and we worried together. And then everything was much better. Doesn't work that way. Okay, But if we're serving the right master, not only is he going to provide what you need, what we need to stay alive, but he's also going to provide for non-critical things, things like our appearance, you know? And, and Jesus says, and why do you worry about clothes? And then probably looking down and pointing at some flowers. Oh, this would be a good illustration. You know, he says, see how the lilies of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. And yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. 
If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he much more clothe you, O little faith? You see, God not only takes care of the birds, he, he causes lilies to grow in all their beauty. And I've got a little picture up here. Uh, uh, this, this is a lily. This is actually a star lily, I think. And uh, our son David sent uh, a bouquet of beautiful lilies to his mom for Mother's Day, and we really enjoyed it. I mean, is that beautiful? I mean, just look at that. I, I mean, look, look at the, the intricacy of the design of that flower. And look how the perfect symmetrical shape and the varying colors of light pink all the way to dark pink. I mean, this thing is exquisite. And so with no effort at all, lilies look great. You see, God is an expert in fashion design. He knows how to make things look really good. And the lily, that lily did nothing. God did that. So here's the point. If God gave this kind of attention to detail to a plant that's going to die in a couple of days, what do you have to worry about? Really? What do you have to worry about? And Jesus' is teaching here is that when we become consumed with worry about our needs being met, we are not trusting God. And that's what he means. Well, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? It's actually, the actual word is, O you little faithers. You know, you just don't have much faith. You see, when we worry, what are we doing? We are not believing the truth about God. We're doubting that, that God sees and that he knows and that he cares and that he's more, more than able to provide for our needs. We're not believing that. And when we worry, we're in a sense saying to God, you know, God, I just don't think I can trust you to run my life. This can't. I mean... I just don't think you're really in control of things, and, and so I've got to worry about this stuff, and I need to depend on me to take care of my needs because I, I just don't believe that you will. When we are being consumed with worry about our needs being met, not only are we not trusting God, we're living as if there is no God. You know, Jesus says, so do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. Now, when you hear the word pagan, that, that kind of makes some strange uh, visions, uh, visuals in our minds. But we're not talking about, doesn't mean somebody who's worshiping idols and sacrificing frogs and doing all those kind of weird things. No, pagan just means somebody who doesn't believe in the one true God. Somebody who consequently is not, if you're not believing God, you certainly can't be serving him with your life. You see, for a pagan, here's what life is about. For a pagan, life is about what you eat and the, what you're going to drink and the kind of clothes that you're going to wear and, and what kind of car you're going to drive, what kind of house you're going to live in. And it's all about the here and now. And that's all they have. That's it. So they run after money and possessions and things. You know, that's what their life is consumed with. And that, that little Greek word for run after is a very intensified form of seek, and it means eagerly or frantically seek something. So pagans then, people who just don't have a clue about God, he's not in their life at all, they, they just spend their money and they hoard their money and they live like, like there's no God in the universe who's watching out over them, who is watching out for them. So what's Jesus saying? He said, don't act like those guys. That's not the way you're supposed to act. Don't live your life like a complete unbeliever who spends his whole life frantically running around trying to get everything he wants and buy everything he wants, and, and he gets all anxious and bent out of shape in the process of doing that. Okay, it's great to know, too, that if you're serving the right master, he knows our needs. This is so great. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. So verse 32 is telling us that God knows all about our needs. Now, he knows all about that financial need that you have right now. He knows all about that car that's right on the verge of breaking down. He knows that there's not a whole lot of drilling going on in the Gulf, and the price is pretty low, and jobs are pretty scarce. He knows about how you're struggling in your marriage. He knows everything. He knows it all. And just knowing that God knows, that helps us to not worry. God knows about this. He's got this. I'm going to be okay. 
But I want to just kind of pose a question that, that perhaps some of you are kind of arguing in your mind as you're hearing this passage and hearing these words. And, and the question is, but what if God doesn't provide? What about those Christians who starve to death? That happens. What about Christians in Iraq who've been driven from their homes and lost everything and been tortured and had their heads chopped off? What about thousands of trusting believers who are serving God with their lives who will die from incurable diseases or car accidents or cardiac arrest? Doesn't God promise to take care of them too? Those are fair questions. Those are questions that we, we need to ask and think about. And those are questions that wouldn't surprise Jesus at all. Wouldn't surprise any of the writers of the, of the scriptures. And, and the book of Revelation, it speaks of martyrs in the future who are, who are going to die for their faith. And uh, Paul told the Romans that even in hardship and persecution and famine and nakedness and danger and sore and slaughter, they would be more than conquerors. Those are some things that Christians go through who are serving God. Jesus told his disciples in Luke 21, 16 to 19, you will be betrayed even by parents, brothers, relatives, and friends, and they will put some of you to death. All men will hate you because of me. Wow. Jesus didn't sugarcoat it. Jesus never told his disciples that being one of his followers, you you follow him, you're going to get an out-of-suffering free card, and you can just kind of pass that little suffering part. So can we really count on God or not? I think at least part of the answer is found, again, back in verse 32, where it says, the heavenly Father knows that you need them. What is them, verses 30 and 31, means that food, the the drink, the clothes, those things that we need to stay alive. And God knows we need exactly what we need to keep on living. And he's going to provide all the necessary food and the necessary clothing and the necessary, you know, whatever housing, whatever we need until the day that we are to die. Psalm 139, 16 says, All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Even before you were born, God knew exactly the day that you were going to die, okay? So that being the case, you know, he's going to provide everything we need until that point, until that time that we die. He knows exactly when we're going to die, and he's going to provide for everything we need to be able to live until that point when it's time for him to take us home and go back and be with the Father. Somebody said this, God promises to give his children what we need to glorify him and live out all the days he has written in his book. Now, sometimes, and we've talked about this before, but as bears repeating, sometimes it seems like God just isn't coming through for us. We're trusting him to provide, but man, it's just slow coming. Sometimes it seems like he's not even there, and maybe he doesn't know about my needs. He doesn't care in some tough time that we're going through. And I just can't help but think of Vital Garcia, who's, uh, you know, how difficult, how frustrating it has been for him, this this bright, intelligent, godly man uh, who's been looking for a job for month after month after month after month. It's just been one dead end after another. He still didn't have a job, and he's been seeking to find a job to provide for his family. And at those times, it's hard to understand what's going on, and it's hard to understand why God hasn't provided. And at those times, God is calling us to not be anxious, but to trust him. And that's what Vital is doing. John Olerud is a, a professional baseball player whose, whose daughter had a rare genetic disease. And during one of her medical treatments, he happened to be holding his little infant daughter in his big old brawny um, pro baseball arms. And he's holding her there as they're attempting to insert an IV into her arm. And Olerud describes, the, as he looked into his little daughter's eyes, he described the look in her eyes this way. He wrote it down. He said, it was like her questioning eyes were saying to me, what's going on, daddy? I thought you were my 
dad, that you would protect me. And here you are holding me down and letting them poke needles in me and hurt me. How can you say you love me and let somebody do this to me? Knowing that even if he could tell her, well, honey, this is why we're doing it, but I don't know. She wouldn't understand. Little infant, she, could, she wouldn't have a clue. You know, Olaroid, his only thing he could really say to his daughter, honey, you just have to trust me. You've just got to trust me, even if you don't understand. Oh, Lord went on to write, Sometimes with our suffering, you look to God and say, God, this doesn't make any sense. I'm getting hammered here, and you could change it. And I'm sure God is looking at us saying, I can't explain to you why I'm doing this. It is in your best interest. You just have to trust me. How can we be worry-free? Serve the right master. Serve the right master. And if we're serving the right master, number three, we won't be consumed with worrying about all the things that unbelievers who don't have God in their lives, we won't be consumed about the things that they worry about. And that instead, we will be consumed with his kingdom. Verse 33, but in contrast to being been out of shape over worry. But in contrast to, to worrying, instead, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given you as well. Now, what does it mean by kingdom? You know, oh, by his kingdom, he's talking about the values and the agenda of the kingdom of God. He's talking about being about the Father's business. And his righteousness, you talk about God's standard, about the right way to live. So, to be consumed with his kingdom, it means that you're consumed with seeing God's reign and his rule over your life, over your family, over your church, over your, your job, over lost people here in the community and all over the world. To be consumed with this kingdom means that you have a burning desire to share God's grace with people who haven't heard about it. To be consumed with this kingdom means that we make it a priority to introduce other people to the king. It means that we ourselves are in that process of becoming ourselves fully devoted followers of Christ. And we're, we're pouring out ourselves into some kind of ministry that is helping to advance the kingdom of God in this world. Because really, that's all that matters. That's all that matters. And you think about it, boy, all, after all that God has done for us, now he's created us and we're made in his image and, and we are lost and he sent Jesus and to, to die for our sins and now we can have a relationship with God that starts now and goes on forever and ever. After all of that, maybe God is kind of looking down from heaven today at Christians and, and sometimes he sees Christians who are living just like pagans. I mean, they're, they're chasing the very same things that pag pagans are chasing after, and they're, they're living these hairy, these worry-filled, stress-filled lives that are not a whole lot different from people who don't know him at all. And maybe, it's God up, maybe God is up there, and he's asking, Hey, is there anybody down there who's concerned about my kingdom and my righteousness? Is anybody concerned about disconnected, poor, lonely people? Is anybody's heart just, just burdened for this whole next generation of teenagers coming into this broken world? Is anybody deeply concerned about little children who have never heard the gospel? Is anybody down there deeply concerned about people in other nations who still haven't heard about me? Is anybody going to talk to your boss or to the guy who, who's next to you in the rig or next to you in the cubicle next to you at work? Or is anybody going to talk to your neighbor or your friend about my son Jesus and what he's done for him? And I'm afraid that the answer that God sometimes hears to those kinds of questions is, no, I'm sorry, but... I'm just too worried about my job. And, and, you know, the economy, boy, it's terrible. And I'm just worried about my retirement. I'm going to have enough put away. And I'm worried about all that stuff, you know, I just love to do on the weekends. And I'm just kind of consumed of all of that stuff. And 
to be honest, I just don't have the time. I, I just don't have the energy to spend on your kingdom and your values and your righteousness. I, I, I'll give a little money now and then. I'll show up here and there. But somebody else is going to have to do that stuff. I'm just too busy. But she says, look, you want to be worry-free? If you want to be worry-free, then we, as servants, we are to seek first, not second, not third, not fourth, not fifth, not on the back burner of our lives that there's time left after we've done everything else. No, we're to seek first His kingdom and His righteousness. And if we do all that other stuff, God's going to take care of it. Yes, you've got to do your part, but God's going to take care of that. Don't have to worry about it. And then the final reason final reason that we can be worry-free as we serve Christ is that we can trust God, our master, to take care of tomorrow. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow's going to worry about itself, says Jesus. Each day has enough trouble of its own. You see, if God is our master, then he promises to provide for our needs. And since he does, we don't have to worry about tomorrow. Someone has put it like this. Anxiety is living out the future before it gets there. Think about that. Anxiety is living out the future before it gets there. And there's no need for us to do that, guys. There really isn't. You know, God's going to be there tomorrow for us, and we can count on him to, to handle tomorrow's problems tomorrow. Not today, tomorrow. As the prophet Jeremiah says in Lamentations 3, to 24, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait on him. What's going to happen tomorrow? Well, there are hundreds of things that we don't know about tomorrow. We really don't. We can't know. We don't know what those test results are going to be. We don't know if we're going to be in an accident tomorrow. We don't know if we're going to run over a six-foot alligator. We just don't know. We don't know if we're going to get hired. We don't know if we're going to get fired. We don't know if we're going to be in a big old bruisal, terrible conflict with somebody. We don't know if we're going to die. Tom- Maybe tomorrow's our last. We just don't know. We don't know. But here's one thing. Here's one thing that you and I do know. Here's one thing that we can count on, and it's this. We do know that the God who loves us will be there in our tomorrow. And we do know that he is faithful, and we do know that he's going to never leave us and never forsake us and that we can trust that he will give us what we need to get through that day so we don't have to worry about tomorrow. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that you are such a glorious, magnificent, powerful God. And that, Lord, you, you exist in, in the present and in the past and in the future all at the same time. We can't comprehend that, Lord, but we know it's true. And Father, we, we confess that we, we do tend to worry. That sometimes we act like people who don't even know you. But Father, we just pray that you would just uh, grab a hold of our hearts, that Lord, you are really the one that we treasure above everything else. That you're number one, that we're seeking you first in your kingdom and your righteousness. And Father, we know there, there's some people here right, right here today, and, and there's some horrendous things perhaps that they're worried about, some things on the, the horizon that they just don't know how they're going to handle. Give them your peace, Father. Help them to know that they're children of you and that they, they serve you. But Father, there may be some here this morning who who are anxious and who are all bent out of shape and just wrought with life and what might happen. And it's because they're not serving you. And they're not serving you because they don't know you. And so, Father, if anyone here is this morning and and they would like to, to begin to not be so consumed with worry and to be 
have that replaced with you in their lives. I just pray that they would just turn to you right now in the, in the quietness of this, the, this church. And they might just say some, to you, Father, something like, God, I am worried. And you know what I'm worried about. And God, I feel like I'm all alone. I've just got to slug it out on my own. So God, I'm letting you know that I want you to come into my life and help me with the burdens of life. God, I know that, that what's separating me from having a relationship with you is, is my sins. All my shortcomings and failures and all the things I've done wrong. But God, I understand that your son Jesus, that's why he came. From the day he was born, his goal, the goal for his life was to go to Calvary and die on that cross to pay for every single one of my sins. So God, I thank you for that. I believe that your son Jesus is God. And I believe that his death did pay for all my sins. So Jesus, come into my life and be my Lord and my Savior. So Father, we, I just pray that people prayed that prayer, Lord, that they can let somebody know that they can begin their Christian life, Lord, and begin to grow and mature and develop. And that as they do, Lord, they'll experience less and less and less worry and anxiety. Father, we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.